Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming in on a Saturday. I really appreciate it, especially knowing how late you work um, on your studio projects. My name is Cindy Lamaro, and I'm head of the lighting design program at Carnegie Mellon, where I teach in both the School of Architecture and the School of Theater. And that's where the cross-disciplinary work comes together uh, in terms of projects that I have my own students do as collaborators. And this is Chris Popowich over there. Uh, he is my design partner in CNC Lighting. Both of us work professionally as not only architectural lighting designers, but theatrical lighting designers. So we are able to bring uh, dramatic quality to our architectural lighting and an understanding of how light affects people and materials, which is something that's important as you cross over. So I'm going to, the workshop is divided into four parts. So the first uh, section is going to be what I call a lecture demo, in which I'm going to uh, be showing you the um, physical properties of light and how they impact how we see. Then uh, there are going to be two lab exercises where you will be working in individual groups. One will be a lab exercise aimed at uh, light and material. And then a second one will be a lab exercise that's more about lighting people and creating mood in a space. And then finally, the last component of the workshop will be taking everything that you've learned hands-on for lighting, and we're gonna bring it back into the architecture world. And I'm gonna show you a PowerPoint presentation that takes everything that you have done today and shows how the architectural lighting designer used the physical properties of light and lighting all of those buildings. So it'll be uh, uh, looking at both interior spaces and exterior spaces. All right, so we're going to start out talking about uh, what I call the physical properties of light. And these are the tools that lighting designers use to manipulate light for a design purpose. So there's four properties that I'm going to talk about today that we're gonna be looking at, which is intensity, angle or direction of the light, the color of the light, and then what I call movement of light. And we'll talk about the role that movement of light has um, in the world of architecture. <coughs> so starting with intensity of light. Um, first of all, it's in a, a subjective impression of brightness. So while every time we bring up a light, we bring it up to a certain intensity from zero to 100%. I don't, as a designer, really care whether it's 75% or 100%. What I care about is how bright does it look to the eye, to the viewer that is looking at that space. So for example, if I have a dim light on along with bright light, like if we look around this space, it predominantly is being lit by fluorescent lights, yes? And you don't really notice <coughs> anything else on in terms of the source of light, correct? Okay, now, Chris, if you could turn off the fluorescence. This light we didn't see because all of the fluorescent lighting was on, but now when we take that out, this light appears very bright subjectively because it's now contrasted by a black void. So that's what we do is use our eye to determine how bright a light is when we're lighting a space and creating different focal points within that space. The thing about lighting, as you know, is that there's the artistry of light and then there's the physiological parts of light. So it's both an art and a science. So I'm talking now about the physiological aspects of light. So adaptation, we know that the eye adapts to light. How many people have gone from a bright sunny day outside and then you come into a really dark room? People have experienced that? Okay, so what's happening? Never mind, don't go Is it hard to see when you come in from the outside into the inside? <laughs> right, because your eye adapts to light. So when it's really bright and you come into the dark space and you fumble around until your eye adapts to the darkness. So the same thing can happen if it's a really dark space and you've adapted to that and then you go outside and it's a bright sunny day and it actually physically hurts your eyes. So what's important about that from a design standpoint 
is understanding that our eye adapts to darkness and to intensity, and that the older that we get, the longer the response time for the eye to adapt. So if we are lighting a public space that is gonna be used by young people and older people, we need to make sure that we do not have too many extreme contrasts of lightness and darkness. Otherwise it's hard for the eye to adapt and it could be a safety issue. So we do have to think about that. Visual fatigue. Our eyes become tired. So we wanna make sure that the light isn't too bright or has too much glare, that it's too dark and our eyes are straining so we can't see very well, or that there's too many rapid changes of light so that if uh, it might not happen in a public space, but for example, if you were seeing a theatrical performance and somebody decided to do, or a rock concert, and they started flashing the lights on and off, after a while, you would go nuts with the light changes happening, and it wouldn't be very comfortable. And once our eyes become fatigued or it's no longer a comfortable situation, we stop listening or paying attention, and it adversely affects the audience. Visual perception. Intensity affects how well that we can see objects in space or people in space. So the higher the contrast, that's going to enhance our visual perception. If it's very flat contrast, then it's going to take away from our visual perception. And the amount of illumination that you need to see a person or an object properly depends on how far away the light source is from the person or the object and whether that object is reflective or matte. Is it reflecting light? Is it absorbing light? And then the last part of intensity is that intensity is closely associated with mood. So that if you have bright intensity with high energy, people tend to be more alert, which is why in a workspace you have such bright lighting and then as soon as you take the intensity down and have dim lighting, that's when, which is gonna happen in a few minutes, that's when you wanna fall asleep. It's dim, it sucks the energy out. Um, you're not gonna be working in a productive way. You just wanna take a nap, it's, you know, you're tired. So we know that that's both a physiological and a kind of um, psychological reaction that we have to light. So in terms of thinking about intensity as our first property, it can go, what I'm going to do is isolate the different properties and show you what, the, what impact they have. All right, so we're going to start with now looking at intensity. So Chris, if I could have you come stand on the X. And Jeff, could you go ahead and bring up channel 51? And you can take out 59. All right, so here we have a straight front light. And if you notice with that front light, it's just lighting the front surfaces. In other words, it's not wrapping around the body, so we're not getting sculptural shape. So this would be a very flat angle. There's enough illumination to be seeing what we're seeing, but, and there's shadow, so there is some light in contrast. But if we were just going to light uh, a person this way, it would be a very flat angle to use. Okay, so now we're going to look at this with intensity. So could you bring this up to full intensity, please? That's 100%. Okay, so I'm going to look at this. I'm going to bring it down with different intensities, and I want you to look at it at different intensities and then tell me all of the changes that you see happening. Roll it slowly all the way down to zero. Okay, so what did you notice? 
as it was going down. There's no wrong answers, so just shout out um, anything that you saw happening and describing the quality of the light, either the color of it or whether it reminded you of a time of day or a mood or visual perception or anything. Okay, there's a color change, definitely. So can you roll this down again? You can go a little bit faster. Okay, pause. So you can see that the color temperature is dropping and it's getting more yellow, warmer, and keep going down. And uh, take it down to about 20%. All right, so you can see that it's really dropping and go back to full. Oh. that it's dropping its color temperature. It appears very white here. And as we drop it, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. So the color temperature of this light is probably around 3200 Kelvin. So it appears very white here. And as we drop it down, it becomes warmer. So that's changing. All right, let's think about time of day. If we were trying to simulate uh, sunlight coming through a window or just other sources. Okay, this is at full. Take it down to 75%. There's 75%. Okay, take it to 50%. It's at 50. Okay, take it to 30%. It's at 30. Okay, and take it to, say, 10%. That's 10%. All right. What do you think about the change of intensity? How does that change our thinking about what does the light suggest to you? All right, let me start you out from here because of, and actually take it down a little bit further, take it down to like 5%. Okay, here's five. All right, so we might think that the color and quality and intensity of this might remind us of candlelight in a room. Does that, would everybody buy that? Think about that, okay. So now let's increase the intensity to about uh, 30%. Okay, there's 30. Uh, let's take it down to 20. Okay, now we might think that this is a table lamp and that maybe we're, it's an interior space and we've got a table lamp or an overhead lamp on, so the color and intensity of that kind of approximates that. Then bring it up to 50%. At 50? So we might think that this is starting to be later afternoon sun, and then bring it up to 100%. And then mm -hmm. we might think this is really bright daylight coming into a space. So just by varying the intensity, we can change how we respond to that light, both in terms of um, mood or time of day, or um, visual perception. Now, let's talk about mood. Go back to 5%. There's five. And contrast this with 100%. And that's 100. Okay, it changes isolation. When the light is very bright and we're getting lots of spill, we're seeing much more of the room. And when, go back down to 5%. When it's this dim, it's much more closed in and intimate, right? So if, for example, we were lighting a scene in the theater and somebody was uh, very depressed and they were in their space, then this light might be more appropriate for reinforcing that mood and go back to 100%. And if we're just really excited, we just got great news, this very bright, energetic light would be more appropriate for that. Also, we see less of the figure, less of the space at lower intensities than full intensity. Okay, now what we're gonna do is look at angles of light. So Chris, face the light this direction. All right, um, take this out and bring up 58. There's a 58 and 50. Okay, and bring up uh, 52. Okay, so we've got the two lights. You can see the diagonal lights 
And what's happening now is the light is wrapping around the figure, so we're seeing much more sculpted. Can you take these out and go back to that uh, 51? All right, so do you see the contrast in terms of how uh, one-dimensional this is? And now go take this out and go back to the 56 and 58 and how well-rounded that is. Can everybody see the difference there? Okay. Now we need what's going to be a side light. So if this is 56. That'd be like uh, 51 or 55. Yes, so take these out and bring up 51. Okay, and do you see how it's lighting just half the figure? And we've got a lot of shadow on this side of the body, but this is actually a very sculpted angle because it's lighting the body in space. We're gonna look at differences between lighting angles on people versus material. So this angle, for example, is used a lot, if any of you have seen dance concerts, they wanna light the dancer's body in space, so we're always using lots of side light. So this one is um, 51, you said? Yeah. Can you add 55? Okay. Okay, so now we have two side lights coming, and it's very sculptural, but you can still see the face. So we're still seeing illumination. Now what I want you to do <coughs> is look at Chris, within the space between this and what I need you to do, Jeff, is um, take out 51 and 55 and go back to 56 and 58. All right, so look at uh, seeing the figure in the space. All right, take this out and bring up 55 and 51. And 51. Comparing those two looks, what is one of the major differences in terms of visual perception of the space? Okay, in the, the other cue, we had two front diagonals coming in, lighting this way, and now we're going with two straight sides. What Im immediately changes with the background? Well, I'd say the background's almost glowing. Yeah, and the what happens is if you come in from the front, it's gonna spill light behind the person and it's gonna light more of the room. There'll be more reflection. And if we had white walls here, you would also be lighting the walls because the light would be coming in and bouncing up on the walls. As soon as you go to the side lights, you're now lighting the person independently of the background. So if you want someone to pop out in contrast to the background, then you light angles that isolate them from the walls. If you want them to blend into, then front light coming in will blend into the background. Or you could light the backgrounds separately. So let's look at 53. Okay, so the backlight is going to create a rim of light and actually pull a person forward. You can see the shadow on the floor, but obviously we're not seeing the face very well. And let's take this out and look at 52 and 54. Okay, and these are diagonal backlights. So like the front light, they're wrapping around and so we are seeing more dimension to the body. Add in 57. 57. So now, adding in this front light isn't such a flat angle because we've got diagonal backlight that's creating more of a sculptural wrap around the figure. So he's looking very dimensional. We're seeing contrast, highlights, and shadows, um, you know, shadows in the folds of the shirt and he's well lit within the space. Now, let's take all of this out and give me 59. 
at full. 59 at full. Okay. Now, this top light coming down is, as you can see, it's lighting the top part of the body. It's making the forehead and the nose more prominent. And we're seeing dark, you know, darkness, dark shadow where the eyes are. And it's, if we were to look at this, uh, take 59 out and bring up the front light. Okay, so see, features are all normal. Okay, now take this out and bring up 59. And you can see how it distorts how we're seeing the person in space. It's not necessarily this in a theatrical setting because of the power and intensity of this and the closeness is not a very flattering light when we start to see architectural applications, it's fine because light is coming down, hitting surfaces, bouncing back up, and we're seeing people in normal uh, situation like you would in a restaurant or a classroom or someplace else. All right, so now what I want to do is contrast. We'll look at this low side light first. Uh, bring up 75 and take out the overhead light. Take off the top light? Yes, please. What you'll see with this low side light is, first of all, you're getting a wonderful dramatic shadow on the wall there. It's also a very sculptural light. Again, we use this a lot in dance. You see that half the body is in complete shadow. But what else, let's compare this now. Uh, let's bring up that high side. Look at how the lighting is lighting the floor. And Chris is keeping this look forward. So we're still, we're lighting half the body, but there is a little bit more wraparound and spill that we're getting. But look at how we're lighting the floor. They're both very sculptural. And take this channel out and bring 75 back up. All right, what's the biggest difference between this low angle and the high angle? much less of the space. Right. We're not lighting the floor except for a little ambient glow. So in other words, we're, we sometimes refer to this as lighting the air because we're lighting this volume and we're not hitting the floor. So this person is very isolated. There is no bottom floor. There's no top ceiling. And if we mask so you didn't see the light, it, the light looks like it's just going on in infinity and lighting the air and making him appear like he's floating in space. So again, when you think about lighting people versus walls and ceilings and materials, you know, um, you have complete control over what the viewer is going to see. And particularly, a lot of architectural lighting now is going into creating more magical spaces than just by changing the intensity or the angle or the direction, you're revealing the space or you're closing the space in or you are directing for the viewers. You know, now we're not seeing the background, we're not seeing the floor or the ceiling or the walls. What kind of a mood would you describe with Chris being lit with this uplight? Anger, what else? Halloween. Halloween. <laughs> Right, because it really makes him look scary or uh, perhaps. Also, look at the shadow. See how his shadow is going all the way up to the ceiling? So again, it's elongating, and the shadow can be as menacing as the actual light. Uh, and again, in the theater, you know, there's not much application for uplight in architecture unless you're lighting a wall. But in the theater, creating, like, maybe it's the ghost in Macbeth, or, you know, we're trying to make somebody feel really threatening and menacing, then this angle does just that. And then, Jeff, let's contrast this. Let's take this out and bring up the top light. So... 
How would you describe the difference now between if you had to describe to somebody and you were trying to explain to them how a top light looks versus an up light, what descriptive words might you use or how might you characterize it? Well, I would say it feels smaller with the top light. Yeah, exactly. So the top light, and you can also get a hint from the shadow. That is the smallest shadow. It's absolutely right underneath him. And it's like pressing down and making him appear shorter, whereas the up light makes him look taller, even though it's more menacing. Both of these are distorting in and of themselves, creating lots of shadows. So they could be used um, quite effectively in a theatrical situation. But now we're very isolated. We're very contained. Maybe somebody, um, you know, again, if we go back to the theatrical application and somebody's in their room and they're feeling really depressed, you know, we might do this to make it feel like it's more claustrophobic. And bring this down to 50% intensity. Uh, 50. Okay, and then take it down to 30. And that's 30. So in combination with the intensity and this, it's like closing in, claustrophobic, oppression. We could really, an actor could really work with that in terms of the mood that you were thinking about. And then uh, take this out and go back to the uplight at full intensity. And now, you know, this could be the witches at the cauldron, or, you know, we can create some kind of mystery uh, with this. But again, because it's elongated, it makes it larger than life, and the shadow behind can also be a threatening and more menacing situation. Okay, take this light down to 10. 10%. And now it's very dim, more mysterious color temperature, still could be used for Halloween though. So you guys can all get little up lights and uh, have your rooms decorated. Actually, in the old Bogville houses, they used foot lights from this position and that was pretty much the biggest source of light to create multiple shadows, but again, more of a garish kind of look opposed to uh, a natural look. So this is just uh, mimicking a wall that's been painted uh, white with some texture. And you can see there's a little bit of sparkle in it. So just to show you the difference of how angles, different directions of light can change the visual perception of this. So we're seeing um, just a front light coming in and we're seeing both a little bit, not much texture because it's kind of flattening that, but a little bit of sparkle. And now Jeff, uh, take this light out. Yeah, go ahead and take it all the way out. And now bring up the top light. So see the difference? Because the top light is grazing and bringing in individual light and shadow, light and shadow, light and shadow. And so there's now more depth to the texture. But what happens with um, the sparkles. Do you see them as prominently as you did in the other one? Yeah, so uh, go back to the front light. Take this out. The par? Yeah, take this out and bring the par back up. See how you see lots of the sparkle, but not very much texture. And now add in that top light. So if we wanted to see both the sparkle as well as the dimension of it, we could graze the wall as well as adding a little front light on it to see both the texture and the sparkle. And now take that front light out, or if we wanted it to just be really dramatic, we could just have the grazing light on the wall, the top light. So again, it's um, experimenting with different materials, whether you're using fabric, whether you're lighting walls, whether it's reflective surfaces, matte surfaces, experimenting and seeing how different directions and different qualities of light impact how you're gonna see that. 
and deciding what kind of point of view you want for that space and how you want things to look. Okay, so we know that the primary colors of light are red, blue, and green. And I'd like to just go through and show you that it's more than just a theory and that it actually works when we talk about color mixing. So we can talk about additive color mixing and subtractive color mixing. In the theater, we use both because we are using multiple sources of light to color mix to a resultant color. And then we're using um, some kind of gel that goes in front of the light that is subtractively filtering out certain wavelengths of color uh, to be able to produce. So color is the most complex physical property of light because it has so many variables. Um, it's the color temperature of your light source. It's the color of people's clothes, color of walls, color of skin tones, hair color. And all of these are going to factor into. And when I get to the PowerPoint presentation, you're going to see more specifically how color temperature is impacted in an architectural space. And believe me, it's something that people don't think enough about. We often have um, interior designers come to us and say, the lighting looks terrible, and what's wrong? And we'll go in and we'll say, they gave you the wrong color temperature of light. And that's why the furnishings aren't looking the way that you intended them. So we can see, you know, that's why it's so important that whoever's doing the lighting really understands who's using the space, why they're using the space, what are all the materials, and then how can I make that space really have a wow factor for both functionality as well as ambiance for people spending time in the space. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and bring up se uh, channel 73, and then you can take out the rest of the lights. Okay, so we have um, our primary blue, and then add channel 72. So when we add the red, the red and blue make magenta. Okay, take the red out, uh, take 72 out and bring up 71. And the blue and the green are going to make cyan or a blue green. And then um, take 73 out and bring 72 up. And now we have our red and our green and they color mix to amber. Then go ahead and add 73 in. And we're getting um, all of the mixing of the cyan, the amber, the magenta, and then we're also, where all three of them are mixing, getting close to a white uh, in terms of uh, color mixing. All right, so that is additive color mixing. And we typically say red, blue, and green are the primary colors in the additive color mixing system. We say that magenta, amber, and cyan are the secondary colors in the, prime, in the additive color mixing. Now, when we go to subtractive color mixing, our secondaries of magenta, amber, and cyan are going to become the primary colors. Uh, could you go ahead and take out 73 and 71? And the reason and how these relate is that if we go back to thinking about magenta, how did we make magenta in the, um, in the primaries? Mm -hmm. Red and blue made magenta. And then what made green? I mean, I'm sorry, what made amber? <laughs> Red and green. OK, and cyan was blue and green. Okay, so now when we talk about in light, the subtractive color mixing system, I'm talking about a single source of light. And now I'm going to be subtractively filtering out certain wavelengths of color. So I have my cyan. I have my amber. And I have my magenta. If I put a magenta gel and an amber gel together in the same light source, what color am I going to get? A 
Everybody have it figured out? Okay, what's making up the magenta again? Red and blue. What's making up the amber? Okay, if I put them together, I get red because that's what they have in common. So the magenta is letting through the red and the blue wavelengths. This is letting red and green, what they have in common, is the red. Okay, so now if I do the magenta and the cyan, what's the color going to be? Right, blue, very dim, but you'll see blue. If we do amber and cyan, we'll get green. Okay, now this is very simple, basic theory, but it's at the center of everything that we do as lighting designers understanding color mixing. Now, our world is getting very complex now, both in the theater as well as in architecture, because not only do we have incandescent sources, um, you know, lots of different lamps that we're using, we now have the introduction of LEDs. And LEDs render color differently because they're diodes. Um, these incandescent lamps have a continuous spectrum, whereas the LEDs have spikes in a similar way that fluorescent lighting has spikes. So you're missing part of that continuous spectrum. So LED lighting might look identical on a wall. Like we might have um, a magenta gel with an incandescent source and a magenta LED mixing LEDs to that color. And they might look identical on a white wall but then you put a person in front of them with clothing and the color is going to pop differently because of continuous spectrum versus those spikes. So it's important to understand the different types of lighting fixtures you're using and how the color is being produced because that will affect how you use it in an artistic and a creative way. How we see color depends on the color of the light source and the color that we're lighting and the ability of that color to be reflected back into our eyes. So can you take out the overhead works, please, and just have this red light on? OK, can everybody see these colors? OK, so knowing what you know about color theory, Anybody want to guess what color this really is? Okay, you're going to say magenta. What about this one? You can just guess wildly. <laughs> this one over here. <laughs> right, because this is being primary red, so it's going to distort this range of colors. And why are we seeing some of the squares red? Well, they could either be white, in which white is going to reflect all of the wavelengths of color. What, what other colors could they be that they would reflect back red wavelengths? Yeah, if it's paler tints, um, then that has a whole range of color in them. So if they're lighter colors, they could take on this color. So let's go ahead and see what colors we've really got. So anything that was like a lighter tone or in the warm range that had red in it was going to be reflecting back the red. And anything that doesn't have red wavelengths to reflect back is going to either go gray or black or be some other ugly color that if this were the theater, the costume designer would hate me right now because the colors would be totally distorted and not look very good. But I just want to mimic different color temperatures so you can go ahead and take out the work lights and talk about um, some of the subtleties when a lighting designer is trying to figure out what color temperature of light source they might want and looking at all of the colors that they're trying to light. So if we were going with you know, pale tints, and let's talk about how it changes it. So for example, uh, bring this light up to full, please. 
All right, so how would you describe the color of this light? White. Okay. Anybody disagree? Feels like a nice white light. Okay, we see all of the colors. Okay. Now, what happens when I put this color in front of it? How does it change? It does a little. What? It does a little bit. Okay, it, it actually warms up. It's a warmer color temperature, right? So now we might, in contrast, looking at this, say that this is a white light that would be good for an office because it's kind, or we might say it's very professional feeling, might be used in a bank. You know, it feels white, it's crisp, has good color rendering. And then when we just change the color and make it a slightly warmer color temperature, it warms up the warm color squares. And we might just say that now this is feeling a little more welcoming. Maybe this is the kind of lighting they might use in a restaurant or in a reception area. That it just, instead of being very white and clinical, some people might even say that this might be feel too sterile, and this just softens it a little bit. What if we go to a cooler color temperature? See what it does to the blues and the greens? And what it does to the yellows and the oranges? It actually tones down those yellows and the warms and makes the blues and the greens, the cool colors, pop a little bit. Look what it does to that lower purple. Can everybody see the purple in that corner? All right, when I have this light, you can see that that's a warm purple. It's, it's got, you know, purple, we think of it being made up of red and blue, has a good amount of red, you know, it's kind of a reddish purple. And when I put this color in, it now becomes more violet. Can everybody see that change? These might be very subtle changes, and my skin tone is still going to look okay, but there's a place for when you might want to use a warm color temperature versus a cool color temperature or a mixture based on how it's going to make everything else look in the room. We could then subtly do a paler pink, and that can make everything look good. But again, it changes it from that white now. The white looks a little more clinical or professional. And this is starting, these various changes of color are starting to affect the mood a little bit. And then if we were to put a slightly greenish tinge in. So the point that I want to make in terms of your sources is that there's a whole palette to work with and understanding how that color is going to react to materials and people. But then also, as we start to get into some of the later lab exercises, how color really affects the mood. Now, let me show you what happens when I do a lot of saturated color or density of color. And that's why you have to be careful with how far you go with color. This might be appropriate in a theatrical situation, but look what happens again. I'm just going to go through this quickly. We're going to get to an example here in a second that makes everything go day glow. So it might be very appropriate in a rock concert where we're, you know, trying to create effects for the music. But in an office, definitely would not be appropriate. But want to show you the range of what color and light can do. of that. Now let's talk about
color and contrast a bit. All right, so if I want to heighten a color, I want to give it a lot of its own color to reflect back into the eye. So we have a yellow fabric. And if I want to really make sure that yellow fabric stands out, I'll put a yellow gel in. And I can have yellow gel and white light. And it's going to really enhance the yellow and make it stand out. If I want to tone that yellow down, I might put something in like a cooler color temperature. And now we tone down the brightness of that yellow. All right, so what I'm doing now is two different color pinks. And if I want to separate two colors, then what I want to find out is what don't they have in col common so that I can really push the contrast of how those two are going to look. And then what I want to do is uh, if I want to merge them, I want to find a color that's going to bring them together. All right, so here we're seeing these in white light. And we're seeing them both, and they are different. But now if you want to accentuate and kind of give it a more dramatic mood, take out the center light and bring up the two sides. So what I've done now, because this was a cooler pink than this, is I'm lighting this with a warm amber to make it feel even warmer. And I'm using this as a cool light to really accentuate the cool. So now they look even further apart in terms of the contrast. And now if I want to try to merge them to look like the same color, I take the two sides out and bring up the center. So now I've put in a gel that they both, a color that they both reflect equally well. And now we can see how it's hard to tell. They you know, feel like they're both in the same color family now and have a similar color value to them. Take that out and go back to the two sides. So just by changing the color, I can make this look completely different. So whether that's a painted wall, whether it's furnishings, anything, just by changing the color of my light, I can make something be revealed in a completely different way. And we do this all the time in the theater. We do it a lot in architectural situations, probably more in restaurants or social places where we maybe want to do something a little more dramatic. Certainly wouldn't be doing this that much in a, in a classroom or an office space. But again, just wanting to show you the difference in terms of how color and light can change dramatically. All right, so now I want to talk about um, psychological aspects in terms of how we react to color. And we can talk about colors feeling warm or cool. So for example, uh, we would all say universally that colors like yellow and orange are very warm colors. We would say that blues and greens are cool colors. But what I want to suggest is even though we all have an association with color, that not only um, psychologically how we might feel, but also culturally we have an association with color. You know, color means different things in different cultures. In American culture, people tend to uh, wear black at funerals. Whereas in some other cultures in the world, um, they wear white. And if you go to some countries, um, they make, you know, and especially if you think about um, sometimes the opera, you know, they might use color very symbolically that green means evil or red means blood or war or, you know, we have all kinds of cultural associations with color. But as a designer, you can change people's perception based on how you use the elements and design it in a particular way. So if you could go ahead and bring up the center light, please, Jeff. 
Okay, so we have our white light here, and then I want you to tell me which light is warmer or cooler. All right, so which one is warmer, this one or that one? This one. All right, so this is my warm light now. All right, so now tell me which one is warm and which one is cool. So the first one, which one is um, warmer, the first one or the second one? All right, so this is warm and this is cool. All right, so this was my cool. Now tell me which one is cooler, this one or this one? This one. All right, so this one was cool when it was contrasted with a warmer color. It appears cool because it's being contrasted with a cooler color. So again, people's visual perception will change based on how you set up the contrast of the room or the space and how they um, perceive it visually. Okay, let's see what else we need to do. All right. Color can also um, attract attention. Uh, we, we tend to see color best in the middle of the spectrum <coughs> where the amber range is. And that's where, you know, work light, this kind of range of color, we see everything well. However, it's the most boring and least interesting lighting. People respond to strong color. So we could have the studio floodlit like this, and then I can put, or let me do the red, it's stronger. And your eye's gonna to gravitate to the red because it's more interesting than all of this other color. We can also say that color can come forward in the eye or it can recede. So for example, reds tend to come forward in the eye and blues tend to recede. So where that might make a difference in terms of lighting a space is if we were lighting this white wall with red, it would appear closer to the viewer. And if we lit it with blue, it would tend to recede and seem slightly further away. We can also say that color has an effect on grabbing attention. Okay, which color dominates or draws your attention? Okay, so the red is definitely grabbing our attention more, and it's doing that for several reasons. One, talking about the red coming forward, the blue receding. Second, the red is allowing more intensity through than the blue, so it's actually brighter, and it's appearing as a denser color. <coughs> um, Jeff, go ahead and take the red down to about 30% intensity. Red at 30 Okay, so now the blue is clearly brighter than the red, but does it dominate? No, the red's still that density of color. So again, if you're wanting to attract people's attention, selectively using color as a way to draw them in. So for example, you're lighting a restaurant and you want to have that wow factor when they come in and maybe there's some kind of sculpture or something that you want to be the focal point. Yes, you can do it with intensity. Yes, you can do it with just the direction of the light. But if you also want to really nail it, you can use color and that will, people will definitely gravitate towards that area. Okay, so let's go ahead and bring up